Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Trorig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, XL Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company, M&T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Must Development, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Sheldrake Organization, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynian Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. Healthcare is the leading industry in New York. It drives the economy. It employs more people. It services everything. And last week I had the heads of the healthcare systems. The healthcare systems are run by certain great doctors, administrators, but the real key, the people who really run the healthcare systems are the trustees, the, the board of trustees, the individuals who take time out of their life, who, who do this on a volunteer basis to talk about what's going on and, and help these organizations run. Uh, today, I'm fortunate to have four prominent board of trustees to talk about health care. My guests include Arthur uh, Hedge, uh, ABR Partners, who is a trustee for many years at the New York Presbyterian System. Joel Pickett, who is chairman of the board of Gotham Construction, uh, former chairman of the Real Estate Committee at Continuum Health Care System and a senior trustee and a member of the Executive Committee at uh, Continuum Health Systems. Dr. George Heinrich, who is the chairman of the board of the New York Hospital Queens, who is also the chairman of the Silvercrest Nursing Home and a member of the New York Presbyterian Health Care System. Uh, and last but not least, uh, David Tanner, who is uh, the head of um, investments for Continental Grain Company and also the chairman of the board of the Montefiore Medical Center. I got that down all perfect. <laughs> you know, David, you know, we were talking prior to the show. You're, you're a freestanding institution. Uh, Continuum is, is five so it is New York Presbyterian is humongous. I mean, the, how, you know, what are the challenges today that you have, you know, servicing all these people in the Bronx? You're the third, you're the fourth largest employer in the city of New York. You're probably the leading employer in the borough of the Bronx. In the Bronx, right. And the Bronx is, with 1.6 million people, is the tenth largest city on its own in, in, uh, in, in, this, in the country. Um, you know, I think these are extraordinarily complex organizations, uh, and uh, they run, especially in New York, on razor-thin margins. And I think it is a real testament to some of the people you had last week on the show that they can run these extraordinarily complex organizations as well as they do uh, and survive through very, very difficult times, including this current uh, financial environment. So it, I, I, I think our role as trustees, to a certain extent, is an easier role than the ones that the CEO and the senior management teams of each of these institutions have. Um, and in, in that regard, um, I think our job is to bring as much business acumen um, to these complex entities as we possibly can, working in partnership with uh, very talented management teams. George, when you joined the board of New York Hospital, 
it was known as Booth Memorial. It was owned by the Salvation Army. Yeah. I mean, this was a flushing community hospital that really was not in the greatest of financial shape. It, you know, many community hospitals do not survive, as we've seen over the years. Okay, w what has gone on? What's happening with the evolution? Right now, you're involved with a major expansion, a $200 million expansion, uh, including 80 new beds and a five-story structure, including a three-story parking lot. Tell us, how, you, how has this happened? I think it's a clear perspective of the trustees and the leadership of the institution to understand that we really need to serve the needs of the community. We're driven by our mission of community need, and there are two and a half million people in Queens. Uh, the service opportunity, the healthcare opportunity, is really an underserved market. And so we recognized that we needed a change. So we looked at the different aspects of our environment and said, this is the time to really restructure from an educational patient care perspective to really serve the needs of the community. We looked at the programs that we needed to develop from access like emergency department, we rebuilt it. In difficult times, we put up a building. We're putting up our building now and it's a insight to what we need to do and to be efficient and not lose track of what our core mission is, which is really serving our patients, and being able to integrate those services and become more efficient at doing that. So that, that's how we focus it. The philanthropy is very important. We don't have a lot in Queens, so we need to look at other ways to provide efficient care and integrate. We have a, a lot of community physicians who practice and bring their patients there. We need to serve all our customers, not only the patients, and to do that better. And I think over the years, that's what we do. Here we have uh, on this side of the table, we have two in two individuals representing the, the, the let's call it the uh, uh, the grand pupa, the you know the 850 pound gorilla, uh, or the Presbyterian system, which you know is Columbia, Cornell, and all, all of this, and then you continuum, which is five different hospitals. And what we were saying prior to the show was there's also another thing. People always wanted to come to New York City. They didn't want to go to the Bronx. They didn't want to go to Queens. That, that is, what has changed over the years? And then I'm going to ask you how you maintain getting good patients. Well, you know, we benefited, I think, substantially at New York Presbyterian when we, a decade or so ago, brought together uh, two great institutions, the New York Hospital at Cornell and Columbia and Presbyterian into the what is now New York Presbyterian. And we've had a great decade plus of, of performance during that period of time. But we face, like David talked about, a very tough environment here in New York. And uh, I see the greatest challenge uh, in my tenure as a trustee uh, before us in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. It's going to be very, very difficult. So that's the biggest change I've seen. Joel, I think the Continuum Health System is like 11 years old now? About that, yes. Okay. And you were on the board of Beth Israel at that time. Why the Continuum, why was it created? It was created because the concept was that we had to be larger to survive, that there was e economy in purchase of, uh, for example, materials that are going to a hospital and that you could operate better if you had a uh, synergistic system in which... Uh, the um, economies of scale. And, and I think that was, was the major reason that, uh, given the changing world, that larger was better. Have you, do you think it's been a, a full success? You remember, you know, the Mount Sinai MOU was yeah. a failure. I mean, that was a, mm -hmm. a total nightmare. Mm -hmm. And in art, in many cases, everybody felt at the beginning with Dr. Skinner, let him rest in peace, it would have been a failure also. I think part of it is is senior management and able, you know, you know, management of hospitals, trustees, and others putting this together. We wouldn't have done the merger if senior management at both institutions hadn't agreed that that was the right strategic direction for a number of the reasons that Joel talked about, the economy of scale. Yeah. I, I think there were a lot of bumps along the road to answer you because uh, we recognized putting these systems together is not um, easy, and it took for a while, I think, for Continuum to actually have an identity. 
people didn't really know what we are were you know, or uh, what St. Luke's Roosevelt was or Beth Israel uh, you was. Know, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the week before we did have the, the president of Continuum, and people, you know, people say, what is Continuum? Mm -hmm. You know, people know there is a Beth Israel. You know, they, they, they know there is a, you know, St. Luke's Roosevelt. You know, they, they don't, and, and your website is We Heal ny.org right. you know, so people say, well, what's we heal and then you're in Dwayne Reed and other places you know so it's but, but I think that was a problem you had we had different medical schools so we had a uh, Beth Israel is affiliated with Einstein uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt is affiliated with, with Columbia uh, Columbia PNS uh, actually Long Island College is affiliated with Downstate so one thought process was, should we have one medical school? And we got by that, and we left that alone. And I think what it was, it was a gradual process instead of trying to impose a will upon one hospital or the other. And I think over time, it, it has worked. And, you know, the interesting thing, which we didn't discuss last week, which we discussed prior to the show, is that all four of you, in addition to being great institutions, each one of you has our academic facilities, your training facilities for the academic. I mean, uh, Montefiore, uh, even though, you know, Einstein has the involvement with Beth Israel and the Continuum, is the teaching hospital for Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, Presbyterian is Columbia, Columbia and Cornell. And Cornell you know, uh, we're, we're the major off-site teaching facility for Wild Cornell medical students. Half this class comes through our facility <coughs> over there four years in one way or another. So that, that, and that was a major shift as we became an affiliate there. You know, we were saying before, you're an independent. How do you stay independent? They're a system, they're a system, you're part of a system. How do you? I, I think it's hard, it's not often said that one of the big advantages of being in the Bronx is that we can dominate the Bronx. And it is a, it is a huge so, so borough. So you're like the Yankees, right? <laughs> We we uh, we share the same borough, um, but we we have the dominant market share on the Bronx. And you know what? If we had the money that they put in the cost of the stadium, we could have built a really lot of new hospital and more beds. We agree with that. You want to get into that? <laughs> um, we agree with that. We're trying to work out a trade, but it hasn't it hasn't come through yet. Um, but that allows us um, focusing on our core market, which has been and will continue to be the Bronx, has allowed us to put together um, a series of campuses. Um, through acquisition and through uh, combination and, as, and another set of affiliations with other institutions in the Bronx that really allows us to operate efficiently and serve um, the community uh, of the Bronx, which is an important mission uh, for Montefiore. And, and how much of your business would be uh, coming from Westchester? I mean, because the Bronx and Westchester is not far uh, from each other. I, I'm not sure I can give you a precise <coughs> statistic, but it's less than 10%. And George, how much of your business is Queens? All it's, all, it's all Queens. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of out migration from Queens. We're essentially capacity, and the 80 beds are important that we're adding. We have the same problem that all the other institutions here have emergency department capacity issues, uh, and we serve the community, and, and certainly in these economic times. I would think that's going to get worse. So, so he, you know, you bring up the economic times, and I think we have to bring up the economic times. We, you know, we have unemployment. We're going to have much more unemployment. We have potential budget cuts in health care spending and other situations. We have major problems with the stock market. Dow was down 38 percent last year. <laughs> the year isn't starting off too much better this year. Um, philanthropy is what helps your business and unfortunately investment results with bad. How are you as trustees, how are you going to take care of the deferred maintenance? I'm not even talking about the new buildings. I mean, you spent a hundred and maybe two hundred and seventy million dollars doing new properties. Yours is two hundred million dollars. Presbyterian constantly is building both in the north and the, the, the side shore. You're building. How are you going to be able to continue this in light of our miserable economy and everything else? Well, I, I think in this environment, I think everyone will tell you that capital projects are either on hold or certainly being delayed. Um, but the Montefiore model is built so that we are not dependent on philanthropy to provide the quality of care and the community service that we provide today. So we are a self-sufficient model absent any philanthropy. So philanthropy for us has been the icing on the cake. It's what allows us to do new initiatives and to, uh, and to continue to grow and to expand services and programs. And it is unfortunate, but I think one of the 
requirements in today's um, in today's environment is that we are going to have to put some of those projects either on a slower uh, track or on hold uh, until we have a little better clarity. I mean, Art, you know, you've gone through the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, the Milstein Heart Institute, you know, all of these situations. I mean, th this is due to philanthropy. I mean, Absolutely. the majority, I mean, Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital was totally philanthropy. All, all philanthropy, no debt. So how do how do the new projects, the diabetes center, a potential cancer center up in the in, in the Presbyterian, how do these and some of them have to be done. You know, we were talking about duplication and certain other things, but there is a need over there. Well, if indeed philanthropy does slow down, and one would expect that it would in 2009, uh, I agree with uh, the scenario that David laid out. We will slow things down, defer things that can be deferred. Anything that's in the pipeline now will be finished. And we have a self-sustaining model as well. We don't need philanthropy to keep a high quality of care in the institution, but of course it's going to cut back on investment. There's no question about it. We, if that philanthropy uh, dries up or slows down. Right. Joel? Well, our, our philanthropy is also uh, for capital projects. Um, and we, you can fund also some hospital improvements out of depreciation, which, mm -hmm. which we do as well. And I think the key thing, as David said, is, is you want to be able to keep your level of care up. I mean, that, that's, that's what we're there for, is to serve the patients. And I think we're going to see a time when all capital programs are on hold. And uh, in terms of keeping up the, uh, the institutions to at least so that they can serve is sometimes difficult because we all have old buildings. And I think we do have a problem. You, you know, last week we were talking, and even we were joking with uh, Grossman from NYU, saying, you know, they have their own radio. They're on Sirius XM <laughs> radio. You know, I don't know how well it does. You know, they have people listening. I'm not certain if the person in Missouri who's on F, who's listening to Imus, you know, or, or Howard Stern is going to be going <laughs> to, to, to the NYU Medical Center. But you're competing with yourselves. You're competing with other institutions. Your, your biggest competition is probably with Long Island? Uh, we, we have competition both east and west. Uh, the good news is we have two and a half million people in, in the middle, and, and we have an incredible opportunity in the market share because we can grow and we can develop as our capacity grows. A philanthropy has not been a major factor, and it's been for extra projects in Queens, and we're just a, in a throes where we were starting to build philanthropy f with a change from Salvation Army to uh, the then New York Hospital, now New York Presbyterian, uh, it, there was really not a philanthropic base. And we have been successful in that, but it's really good news for us as we go forward. Whatever there is, we can try and capture. The challenge that I see is real, from a board pers perspective, which is really critical, is, is helping and guiding the leadership in what's deferred, what's patient care sensitive, what's quality, and educating the rest of the board that we take that responsibility, which we have. Ultimately, the board is responsible for the quality of care. All of you are unpaid. I mean, this is, this is volunteer. There is no one sitting here who's, who's a paid. And many of you put many, many hours a day and a week to this situation. What, what do you think is the, the biggest hurdle that each one of your institutions have in the next year or the next five years to come? For us, we are, um, we are operating at total capacity. So we don't have the ability to grow um, our revenue base merely by adding uh, more patients. Um, so for us, the challenge is changing the nature of, uh, of the case mix uh, that we are providing. And we are trying to push um, towards higher acuity cases through creation, the creation of centers of excellence, which has a cost. Um, we need to bring in the top doctors. Um, we need to have the facilities that are capable of um, allowing those doctors to practice and, uh, and do what they do so well. Um, but that is, in, in order to, to keep up with um, our revenue base, which is predominantly Medicaid and Medicare, um, which where the rates come down or don't grow with inflation every year, we need to continue to grow um, our revenue base through um, higher case mix. And that's, 
that's that's our challenge. I think we're I think we're up to it, um, but uh, it's the conundrum of of uh, being an institution that's seventy two percent dependent upon uh, federal and state um, uh, pay. George, the, the other factor, David's right on target to look at <coughs> the type of patients for which uh, we care. But the other piece of that is improving the quality of care through efficiencies. There are clearly ways that patients can get still better care. Patients shouldn't be in the hospital unless they really right, need to be in the hospital. Right, but you know, George, you're, you're a physician, and, I, and I, you know, it's interesting. I remember a number of years ago, um, I had some surgery, and I, uh, I was in NYU, and uh, I, uh, I forgot the care center. I was there a number of days, you know, because they had to, uh, you know, take care of a, a feeding tube and something like that. Today, it's daycare. I mean, mm -hmm. It's day center, day surgery. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's more efficient. You know, you've but been that's on the better board quality too. That's better quality. Hospitals I'm not, are for the very sick. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hospitals yeah. should only people be shouldn't right. be in the hospital. You had uh, pneumonia; they didn't let you yeah. go. Yeah. No. People, people shouldn't be in the hospital. We should keep them as healthy as we right. can. Yeah. Uh, that's really our goal, and the hospital should be there for the most intense care that's required. And that is not the model in hospitals uh, at this point. Part of it is bottleneck in the emergency room. Part, part of it is... But, but isn't that really, it may not be the model, but the model is when the government is giving you DRGs and they're paying you for a set amount of time for, right. for a case, Correct. it doesn't matter. They're gonna, right. you know, you're only getting paid X, so you right. better become more efficient on that situation. But, but it's also better care at the same time. Uh, uh, there is always the uh, opportunity to get patients out too fast, which isn't good. So it's a balance, and the efficiency part of it is very important because if someone's waiting for a test result, or if someone didn't get a test result, or someone's doing too many tests, that's where the opportunity for improvement comes and the patient wins. Right. And that and needs to be the driving force. You know, Joel, over all the years, you know, that you were the chairman of the yeah. real estate committee, you know, and on the executive committee, you, you've, you've had to make decisions what property you should buy, what right. property you should sell. You know, how, you know it's well, a tough... Yes and no. I mean, to just follow up on this comment, you know, the system's gone for reimbursing you for as much money as you could spend. <laughs> to this DRG system, which then you had to focus on a reduction of length of stay. And now uh, I think we are focused on quality of care and how to renew ourselves as we go forward, which is very difficult, the shortage of money, which, which leads into your question. I think the important thing is we all have a lot of property. Our system is probably like five and a half million square feet altogether. And uh, in these times, in the good times, if if there was such a thing in the not-for-profit hospital business, we would buy property for use as residences, for uh, staff, uh, for other outlying types of situations. And I think what you have to focus on is you have to keep your super block intact. And other property in these times, we've sold off some of our property to uh, make sure that we could have the capital to spend in areas we had to spend. I mean, very good comment because you have sold off. You, we you have. sold properties on 22nd Street and 3rd Avenue right, right. in your neighborhood because you needed the right. cash flow. Right. We, we to bought do that this. property in the early 90s. We had staff in there, and then we decided that we, we needed the cash flow. We sold uh, the old doctor's hospital, which was Beth Israel North. Well, when we bought it, uh, we had an idea as to how it could work for specialty services. It didn't quite come off the way we wanted it to. And we were able to sell it for a very large number, given the state of the real estate industry at that point in time. But, but as we all know, today that price would have not been there. The values mm -hmm. of land have, exactly. have, have dropped completely. Right. Now, Art, you have a different situation because Presbyterian is basically landlocked. I mean, uh, that, that's the, the, the opposite extreme. That both you know. are major campuses. Right. You know, they, they have to build, you know, you go over, over, the river. Uh, over the river. I mean, maybe hmm. they can build, you know, uh, on top of the mountains over there. Yeah. They'll, they'll build on Dykeman Street, you know. That's a real problem. Um, but getting to your question about what are we, the difficult challenges we face in the next year or so, I think it's been touched on by some of my colleagues here when uh, they talked about the pressure on the emergency rooms. I think as the economy weakens in, in uh, the city, and we're already seeing it, uh, phenomenal growth in the number of people appearing at the emergency rooms. 
and we've modernized all our emergency rooms. And I'm really concerned that it's not going to be enough to handle the, the people that appear at our doorstep. It's a real challenge. It's a challenge from a patient care point of view, and it's a challenge from a financial point of view. Uh, and I think the second thing that concerns me going forward is uh, over the last decade, we've invested a tremendous amount of money in real estate, but also in program development. David talked about it earlier. For example, Presbyterian does more total transplants than any institution in the country, which means they do more than any institution in the world. And uh, that kind of program development, uh, which services a very important need, is very expensive. It's going to be a real challenge to continue to make those kinds of investments in the uh, environment we find ourselves in today. But I, I, I think, you know, when we relate, when the economy is bad, people are going to be going to the emergency room. So, you know, you have, to, you have to have an efficient system within the emergency room to take care of the patients who are sick or sicker. And, you know, and you, you know I think the biggest question that came up on the show the prior week was um, information technology, to know what, what, what's wrong with the patient, what coverage they have, other information over there. I mean, you know, you're the practitioner. You understand it the, even better. The information technology is an incredible challenge. Uh, if, we, if one looks at the very low margins that we all uh, need to identify and have as uh, we cope with those, when there are major state and federal reimbursement changes, if there's talk of 10% off Medicare, Medicaid, we don't have 10%. We're lucky if we have a couple of percent. If we sneeze in the wrong direction, the, the margin right. is gone. I mean, on the show the week before, relating to what you just said, of the 50 states, New York State hospitals, uh, earnings are the 49th, right. the lowest, right. next to Mississippi. And this works into the information technology because the information technology developed in the hospitals in New York is way behind it, uh, where it is in other parts of the country. The information technology challenge is partially because how information technology and healthcare grew up. It was systems put together, a lot of homegrown, built, developed, interfaces. What there isn't is a total overhaul of this with a data warehouse where mm -hmm. all data is together and everybody's looking at the same data and you get rid of all the interfaces from system to system. When you put four people together for half an hour, it's difficult, but I'm really happy that the four of you who are dedicated trustees have been able to provide me and my audience some insight. I'd like to thank uh, Art Hedge, uh, New York Presbyterian System, uh, Joel Pickett, Continuum Healthcare, uh, George Heinrich, New York Hospital Queens, and last but not least, David Tanner, Montefiore Medical Center. Next week, REITs. See you next week. Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, CB Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, GVA Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company, M&T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Must Development, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Sheldrake Organization, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynian Group.